Mark Jeffries, and Matt Pangrad. BTL is brought to you by Lawrence. Lose. Striking Lures. Fast Cat Boats. Ducket Fishing. Spro. AFCO. Big Buy Baits. Sunline. And TH Marine. BTL coming at you. Good Tuesday, everybody. Welcome once again to BTL Bass Talk Live, where we're going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Matthew, as you can see, folks, he is uh, with his pet in Tulsa. And uh, that's quite the interesting dog there, Matthew. I mean, we started out with Buddy the Cat. Buddy the Cat made multiple appearances on BTL. Now Buddy's in a box on the windowsill. Sorry. <laughs> R.I.P. Buddy. Then we had Izzy. Izzy's made multiple appearances. Then we had Andy Montgomery's cat, which, by the way, one of our viewers said we need to pass along to him is a very rare, expensive cat yes. based on the breed. Did you see that comment? I did. I did see that. I can't remember what kind it was. So anyway, Gemma, uh, the French bulldog, she see, she can tell how much she loves getting scratched behind the ears. That just that really gets her going right there. But uh, <laughs> that's Gemma. Jeez. Say hi, Gemma. Wow. All right. Whoa, no. She's all caught up in the cord now. Oh, God. All right. Go all right. lay down over there. Seems pretty oh, chill. What's going on, Mark? Dog's very seem, chill. Yeah, very chill. Very, very chill. There was no, uh, huh. during the selection process, there's no way we could get a hyper one. Very I'm, nice. I'm hyper enough, the way it, hyper enough the way it is. Yes. Anymore. All right. Very nice. Good show today. We're going to have Carl Jakobsen on here just in a few minutes live via Skype. We're going to do the, uh, what? It's, what? I believe it's Jakobsen. That's not I how I it's, say it. It's not a. Why? I know that's not how you say it. Just because that's how you say it doesn't mean that it's the correct way to I say it. I never said that. That's what I'm going to call him, though. He will always be Carl Jakobsen to me. And I will always be Matthew to you. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, good show today. I want to kick off the show, dude. Did you see the story on Major League Fishing? Please say yes. Did you see the lead story no. on Major League Fishing? No. Can you pull it up real quick on your phone there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I had the uh I had the FLW statement pulled up ready for that one. Yeah, on we'll phone. get to that um, in a, we'll get to that in a minute. Major League Fishing. The lead story is Kevin Van Dam cut by a fork at stage 3. Yeah. So they kind of got the jump on it. But I'm just going to go down, and folks, you can go in. It's not a long story. Look at, this, look at the second part of the story where it says, looking to add on day two. And I'm just going to read a couple of sentences from that. Well, what the hell? It's like it's like they literally tried to jump your interview. I know. Them. I know. <laughs> what the hell? I, like yeah, yeah. Like, you know what? That's a great damn question. I, I know. For you, Kate. I know. They jumped no, I mean, my not question. Saying that that's exact. Not saying that's what, what happened. But it was a good story. I, but that's I, what happened. That's. I'm telling you, dude. I I questioned the guy just from a fan and from an angling perspective on what the heck happened. And I guarantee you, I wasn't the only guy in this country that thought the same thing. But then you have people out there like Scott Strong who wanted to come after me because all I was doing was wanting to Keep know. Keep coming after him, Scott. Keep coming after him. What the hell happened so on day like, two? It was like, uh, all right, let's be honest here, Mark. I'm going to blow a lot of people's minds. A lot of these anglers uh, – they like just transcribe their personal blogs. Like Kevin Van Dam isn't there on a typewriter. Like doo, no, it's, doo, 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 it's ghost written. Or, it is ghost written. Right, but I mean, I know how th this stuff works. Th this is what they they say. This is what they say. A lot of it's transcribed. I guess is more so than ghost written. Wouldn't you say? 
where they call up someone and they talk and then that person puts what they yeah, said down. But yeah. I, I would be interested in knowing. I mean, I'm not, I don't know. That's an interesting deal. Cause I mean, this is as he wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. I made a play for a bailout with the jerk bait. It let me down. Yeah. All right. I don't know. Maybe he's just setting the table. Maybe it is all Kevin Van Dam. Maybe he is up there in Michigan as ice out happens, just typing it out, just setting the table for his BTL interview. So he has some literature to point to. I just think it's weird. And here's why I think it's weird. He, he hasn't had that great a major league fishing career. Would you admit to that? Which is no, no, he has had an amazing major league fishing career. He has not had a stellar BPT career. I, I stand corrected. You are correct. All right. On the BPT. But obviously, we're only one year into it and all that and everything. But just out of nowhere, this obscure story about something that I think that the vast majority of people may or may not have been interested or may or may not even captured the fact of what the hell happened to Kevin Van Dam. Now, I got to give him give the benefit of the doubt here because there are a number of what I would classify the superstars who suddenly realize, oh, crap. I got to do more stuff. I'm being pretty candid here this morning, Mark. Yeah. But you got Edwin Evers out there now. You got Skeet Reese. You got Kevin Van Dam. They're putting out literature. They're putting out photos. They're putting out highly produced videos following each tournament. They're breaking down every cast. I mean, for the past 15 years, these guys did not do any of this stuff. And now all of a sudden, they're all doing it. So maybe it's just part of the new transparency the new superstar transparency that we're seeing from kevin van dam who's going to break down what happened after every tournament win lose or draw yeah but here's the deal dude Fair there wasn't I, I i get it but there wasn't anybody anybody from a media perspective that said anything about this story as far as what the heck happened you did you did i, I was the only one and then people were coming after okay. me because I was questioning what Kevin one Van Dam. One guy. Was no, 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 dude. You, you didn't see the other one, emails this is that I media got. And, 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 media and, sensationalization, right? No, here. no. Did you get? You got some some DM. You, we call those DMs, direct yeah. messages. Yeah. No, I got I got some instant feedback and I got some emails. Uh, but yeah, there was only one dude. All right, that was coming after me on YouTube. But it, once again, well, we'll I, see, but I, I wasn't honest, questioning. It's Thursday or Friday? It's Swindle Thursday, Van Dam Friday, no, or Van no. Dam Thursday, Swindle Friday? Van Dam's on Thursday. He's Van on Dam's Thur on Thursday. So we're two days away from setting the record straight here. Yeah. I, I, well, oh, we're not setting live, the, There's no Skype record to set. Phone? Do what? What? Is he live via Skype or just on the phone? Uh, no, he's going to be live via Skype. That's the plan right now. You see my my coffee mug this morning. So this is one of the cool things. So over the years, I've collected a lot of cool coffee mugs because my mom likes to go places and look at cool coffee mugs. So if you see, I've had the BASS mug back from the Kmart days. Oh, very nice. Yesterday, the yeah. last couple of days, that mug yeah. was actually in a Cass and Kids pack. Today, I have the largemouth bass mug where the, the handle is the tail yeah. of the largemouth bass. Uh, that's pretty I'm going to break out some, some collector's editions the rest of the week. Oh, very nice. It's kind of hard to hold, though. I feel like it's going to slip. Yeah, very, very nice there. We'll get it straightened out. We'll get it straightened out on th Thursday, Mark. We got a good one today, though. Carl. Going to have Carl on here in a few minutes. And uh, uh, he's got some new baits coming out. He's going to talk about that. I had an interesting conversation uh, with Chris Prather last night, who is absolutely bored out of his mind. With nothing to oh, do. Oh, yeah, because they're not bowling. <laughs> yeah. hey, at least he's won enough this year to where he can hang. Isn't he up by Chicago, too? Yeah, he's in Chicago, and the weather in Chicago Born has been heat. huge. Hey, don't eat that. Sorry, what? But I said the weather in Chicago has been hugely bad. He hasn't even been able to get out. Yeah. He tried to go to some uh, neighborhood he's ponds. Bad. What are you doing? Hugely bad. Yeah. He's yeah I'm just trying to mentally digest your comment where you said it's been hugely bad well big city chicago 
massive weather conditions. The wind always blow. Hugely leave me alone. Bad. Okay. Let's All right. Go. Leave You've me alone. You've been listening to too many daily updates, Mark. Continue. Leave, leave me alone. All <laughs> right. The fact is, he can't even go to his neighborhood pond areas because he got ran off. Yeah, they're. He got ran lockdown. off. That's the only. So he's he's going through just all kinds of just boredom and. Anyway. I believe that there's a couple of those video games that he could get going on. Yeah. Like yeah. that dovetail fishing one, and then doesn't Iconelli have one that he's been promoting I too? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, there's one that Scott Martin's promoting, and then one that I think Ike is to where you can like comp- you can like hook up to the network and compete against people. Yeah, online. Any, I I get it, and that's pretty cool. It's kind of like the whole what they're doing with NASCAR, watching you know the i racing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I told him we talked about that we we're going to have Carl on. And we started talking about swim baits, of which I don't know a whole hell of a lot about. I mean, I am a generalist. You are an expert when it comes to the swim baits. But he wanted to know from No, 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 no. I'm proficient in two of them. Okay. I, I know, I feel confident that I understand several applications for them. I am, I am a novice, Mark. You know more than I do. Much, much, much more. Okay, yes. when it comes to yes. swimming. Anyway, still a novice. his question, we were talking about who we're going to have on the show. You know, we got Zaldane on tomorrow. We got Carl on today. He wanted to know and was intrigued by the usage of swim baits during the spawn. And then yeah. I, I brought up your story of how big was the fish at Arbuckle that you caught on the swim bait? 10-2, is that right? The one with you? Yeah. That was 11.4, but oh, that wasn't on a swim bait. I thought that was on a swim bait. No, no, no. The Arbuckle swim bait story is when I – two years ago when I chucked it out over that point and I'm gliding it back and two of those big shadows – you know where the big rock is. Yeah. The giant rock yeah, and yeah, the yeah. cove. Yeah. I fired out over there and it's – I mean it's woo, it's gliding back and I'm like, oh, that looks good. It's one of those perfect days. Just barely post-spawn, ripple on the water, no one else out, clear. And just two giant dark shadows rise up from the abyss, right? Yeah. And I mean, knee knockers right there. So I stop and I do one half hitch on it. And I mean, one between eight and 11 just engulfs it. And I, you know, nail it as hard as I can. I get two cranks, it freaking tail walks, throws my bait in the air. And as the bait lands, I see the other fish streaking over that's following it through the air. As soon as it lands, boom, the other one just drills it. I have it on for three or four cranks. It pulls off. I come in. My hook hangers are destroyed, one on the front, one on the back. And that's how I lost 20 pounds on one cast at Arbuckle. Okay. But (laughs) getting back to the point that I was trying to make, the efficiency, the effectiveness – the reliability, the applications of using swim baits during the spawn. Is there oh, something yeah. there? This is them off. Big yeah. time, yeah. Yeah. The problem so. is with the big glide baits is if they get pissed off enough to eat it, a lot of times you'll catch them on the outside of the face because they roll on it instead of engulf it. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna talk to Carl about we'll that. Ask Carl about it. Yeah, and then we're gonna have Zaldane tomorrow, hopefully in studio. That's kind of the plan right now. All right, Matthew, what else? The FLW? Uh Item yeah, I that you were going to mention. Up, uh, we we knew this was coming. Uh, we knew this was coming down the road, Mark. And it just it, they had a uh, executive statement. Um, it says today we are taking additional steps of rescheduling all tournaments through May third. So April is completely done. Now here's the interesting thing. They have already rescheduled the Toyota Series Championship, which was at Cumberland, the exact time it was last year, November 5th through 7th, where it was freaking cold. I don't know if you watched any of that yeah, stuff, Mark, yeah, but it yeah. was like they're, they're going to fish Cumberland now December 3rd through 5th. Wow. That could be a little chilly. Yeah. The BFL wild card, uh, they moved it a week later, November 13th to November 20th. Uh, The pro circuit on Lake Hartwell moved from April 23rd to May 28th. The pro circuit on Cherokee Lake moved from April 2nd to June 11th. So what about the All-American? Interesting things. What about the All-American? It was on that list, too, wasn't it? 
Was it not? Mm. Yeah, the All American Hartwell, April thirtieth, uh, moved to November eleventh. Yeah, I missed that one. So here's the interesting thing that I'm getting, and I I had a conversation. I had a conversation with your boy Robert De and read about this. I said, what's going to end up happening is everyone is going to postpone all this stuff, right? But just because you postpone it doesn't mean that you can get back on that lake whenever you want in the fall. You also have to reschedule it, get that permit, right? Yeah. So you've got like five or six turns. So let's just use Lake Hartwell. You've got the Ray Scott deal. You've got the All-American. You've got an FLW event. You've got all this stuff going on there. Well, if you just like say, oh, we're going to reschedule it later, but then the other organizations like what FLW did – is not only postpone it, but then give a date to reschedule, which means they've already got the permits for those dates. Are there not going to be a ton of tournament organizations that like won't be able to get on the lakes anymore because the other tournament organizations, I'm talking state, regional, local, everything, have already got permits for the October, November, December dates if you're not on the ball? Yeah, it's going to be a absolute logistical nightmare to try and get everything in. <laughs> It really is. But it but it sounds like FLW is trying to get everything in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of reasons like for that. Like it's not like hey, we're just not going to do that. But no. Well, they need they're, they're they they need those tournaments. They yeah. absolutely need those tournaments from an angler standpoint, from a, a revenue standpoint, they have to get those tournaments in. Yeah, because you also I mean, there's also a open on Hartwell. Yeah. In the fall. Now there'll be a pro circuit there, but now there'll be the all American. Yeah. In the fall. I, it, I was telling, I said, you're going to get on a lake sometime in when all this, you know, gets under control and, and, and society is somewhat back to normal and we can focus on fishing and pretend like your tournament's important in the grand scheme of things. We're going to get on a lake and there's going to be six club tournaments and a regional tournament going on all on the same weekend. There's going to be 400 boats on this lake. Plus team tournaments. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. By yeah, the way, I, I fully expect, I mean, we should hear something fairly quick, wouldn't you think, about the uh, Santee Cooper event, the Elite Series event. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be postponed, too. Yeah. So, and, and we'll talk to Carl and Chris about this over the next couple of days. Uh, Carl has fished two days this year. Two. Yeah. And he's, you know, he lives on Chickamauga and all that stuff and was probably, probably really been looking forward to it and has had two reschedules now. And I know he's been catching them out there. Yeah. Just a bad, bad deal. All right. Uh, let's do this. Let's take a break and come back, hopefully with Carl live via Skype along with Matt in Tulsa here on a Tuesday. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back. The ultimate fishing system starts with Lorentz HDS Live. Upgrade to HDS Live with a ghost trolling motor, live site transducer, or structure scan 3D and get up to $500 cash back. Yeah. You care about gear ratios, inches per turn, and ball bearings, but most importantly, you want reliability and dependability in the equipment you use. Lose doesn't cut corners when it comes to the gear they build. The new Speed Spool LFS is the best $99 reel in the market. Go see for yourself. We've paired one of the most iconic hulls in the history of bass boats with a proven lineup of trusted accessories. We're bringing you best-in-class value and performance, leaving others in your wake. Turnkey value, turnkey performance. The Pantera 2 is an overachiever in the 19-foot category. Once you hit the throttle, you'll feel the rush, and there's no looking back. Kevin, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just filling in for Billy. I need a 660 Shad crankbaits in uh, the Series 5 model. We're out. You're not out. You got all kinds of them right there. We're out. Kevin, I need six. Have a lollipop. I do not want a lollipop. Have a lollipop.
Do you have it the sexy shad color? At Duckett Fishing, we have assembled the top pros in the country to help us design rods to give you a competitive advantage. Castability, strength, durability, action, sensitivity, weight and balance, and consistency. Combine that with the best warranty in the industry and you have rods that are pro-driven. Duckett Fishing, pro-driven. I want to share to you a new product we got coming up from Sunline. This is the FC leader size spools that we have now. Um, we've gotten a lot of requests for this. A lot of you guys use fluorocarbon for leaders only, myself included. And one of the problems you have is when you have a 200 yard spool, that might last you two, three, four years. You might even lose it before you even get done with the spool. So we've gone to a little smaller spool. These are 50 yard spool sizes. You know, that way you're not holding your line on forever. You can keep your line fresh, use it when you can. It stores real easily in the boat. We got all of our popular line sizes that you're used to with our sniper from five to 14 pound. If you guys are looking for a line that you're only tying for a leader, Go check out Sunline FC Leader 100% fluorocarbon and give it a try. All right, we are back on a Tuesday. We are ready to go to our special guest live via Skype. Carl, how you doing, man? Going good. Going good, mate. All right, we're going to see if we can pull this off. Uh, Matt, you still there? Yeah, you got me. All right, we're all set. We're all good. Carl? Man, Carl, Carl changed into his professional angler attire. He was wearing a hemp T-shirt and a... <laughs> And a beanie earlier. He looked like he was like ready to save the Washington to Redwoods out there in California. Yeah. He put Satan. the flat bill on in the hoodie now. He's all ready to go throw the glad. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Uh, hey, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that, Carl. Uh talk about your new bait and talk about what you've been doing with it and all that and everything. You did uh, a live segment with Bassmaster uh, a few days ago that that seemed to go very well. But I want to know, man, when I was looking back and, and when I was looking at your fishing since the month of September, from a tournament perspective, it has been slim to little. Yeah. Yeah, tournament-wise, since, uh, yeah, what, since, since the win, since uh, Ten Killer, it's, uh, I've fished two tournaments since then, so lucky to get that open in and then uh an elite series event but so much has happened that it's just it's crazy but i, I uh had josh here today and we were talking this morning and i said or last night and i said i think this is the longest i've ever gone since i was about 15 years old from fishing a tournament <laughs> i think it's the longest Talk about, uh, ever josh douglas flw tour pro and malax super guide is that a is that a fair title there? Yeah, definitely. Yep. <laughs> but it sounds. I mean, it looks to me, I follow it on social media, like you. Uh, although the tournaments have been slim, that you are spending a lot of time on the water. Yeah, definitely. You know, I just, I, that's, that's what we do. You know, that's what I love to do. And I think you got to uh, in this sport, you still got to stay sharp. You still got to learn. There's so much to to always learn every single day. And living close to Chickamauga now. Um, this and so many lakes close to here. I'm just so keen to really sort of call this area my home, home style area. You know, I wanna, I don't wanna just live here. I wanna be able to, um, you know, when when Chickamauga comes around or a tournament comes close to here, I wanna, I wanna be one of those guys where this is my home lake and I'm gonna know it well because I just, I've never had that. You know, the last ten years just all over the place and to maybe have somewhere where that is your home lake that you know is going to be pretty cool but yeah just yeah, was, talking to josh i'm like we're fishing we're fishing every day but like i'm like far out i need to fish a tournament here soon. <laughs> how has that changed uh your outlook i mean you you obviously you got the win you have the house now uh it seems like you're kind of settled into that i mean 
Uh, almost everyone knows your your story of of starting out in California and going to Oklahoma and then being down in Texas and now settling in in uh, Tennessee. Uh, is it kind of exactly what what you had hoped it it would be? And do you think that uh, from a fishing standpoint? Now I understand like there's like a life that has to be lived, so I'm sure that like helps with the life being married type thing but from a fishing standpoint yeah. do you think having that stable home base helps and will help moving forward yeah oh, it's massive it is huge you know i lived uh i sort of had my own place uh, when i was say a tournament fish from when i was 15 years old in australia and then when i was about 16 i started fishing as a pro there i was i just knew like this is what i want to do for the rest of my life that's it and I actually moved into my own place. Um, I sort of, my mum had a, a property and it had like a sort of a cottage off to the side of it. Um, it. And I actually moved in there when I was about 17, 18, just by myself. And I ended up like, I worked full time in a tackle store and I just saved up and I built a shed on that place. And I like created my own like fishing, sort of my little fishing deal there, my shop. My little shed had everything ready to go, like tackle on the walls. I had everything like dialed, you know, even from 18 years old, uh, every bit of money I spent went into my fishing career, my tournaments. And I was super organized. I always had like my truck, my tackle and just everything tried to sort of have it to where it was in a, I, I was doing the best I could possibly do to compete you know in in when it came to tournaments and so that just only grew and got better and better and better as i got older up until when i was 26 and then i won like the grand final i came to america and had that trip at the u.s open and everything was unreal but when i moved here like my life just became like scattered like next minute no family no friends no one that i knew half of my fish and tackle in australia a little bit over here just stuff in the back of my truck like it all of a sudden just become like this big all over the place scramble and i was trying to manage that all the time and then wherever i could get some kind of normality i would grab onto it and towards the end you know living in jean's shop was like the greatest thing that ever happened and i was sleeping on a single mattress on the floor around his tool shop and you know when i first got there and i thought it was heaven because i had my boat in there and i had all my tackle under shelter where i could work on tackle no matter what the weather was doing and so i knew in my mind like i everything that i've gone through over here i've always had a vision like this is where i need to get to to be competitive and to have some sort of stable life and and i've always just worked towards that and it was just not achievable without winning an event and having that having that break that every i think professional sportsman gets if they're actually going to make it and so still our life the lance camper and the 1172 and everything the lance sort of life that gave us the biggest most stable uh life that i could possibly get without having a home base to go back to and the only problem with that was getting so much stuff in the mail tackle packing tackle away trying to put it somewhere some of it's in texas some of it's at friends in alabama like i'm just like i i hate i it was it's everything i hate about it because i'm just like i want everything to be organized and know where my stuff is and so the win and everything that happened in that couple last couple months leading up to getting this place has just given us the biggest breath of fresh air and just having that home base and especially with what's happening right now um it's been just an i just can't imagine us not having this place right now but as far as our life goes i think as far as our tournament goes and me and us growing in my career it's only just going to get better and better from here on out all right carl i'm curious what were your top three choices as far as where to settle down and why did you select where you are today yeah it's a good one kayla and i we we've uh you know we've I've just about been to every state in the U.S. I think uh, it's not everyone, but close to it. 
and I've fished in most of them. Kayla has travelled from here to California, Idaho, Florida, New York, back through. And we, uh, like, I just kept, I was always looking, like, I wonder where would be a good, where I'd like to really settle. And, you know, I always thought Texas and that was pretty central. Like, you would think that that was central. But when you're sort of fishing out west, it's like an 18-hour drive back. And we were doing that a lot, 18, 18, 20, you know, down to Florida, 22 plus. And that takes a toll on you pretty quick. And it wasn't until about last start of last year, uh, we had a bit of a break and we found a couple of campgrounds on Chickamauga, which were Blue Water um, and Chester Frost. And they were just beautiful campgrounds, perfect sites on the water. And I started fishing here and had like one of the best glide bait sessions of my life for about a week caught my pb 10 10 caught a bunch of nines and eights it was ridiculous and then from here it was like my favorite lakes lanier one of my favorites and it's two hours away um big spotted bass little secret holes around here just phenomenal then below chickamauga you can fish nicker jack and the dam and get the spillway and the more i looked at it i'm like you can just learn so much from around this area there's just grass fishing gunnersville rock fishing just everything you can possibly learn and then you've got this massive smallmouth fishery all around you like within two hours the state record like smallmouth spotted bass and largemouth are all within like the those sort of lakes within two hours are right here and then uh then we just called into um chattanooga and just really loved that that city you know we, Taylor and I love the outdoors we love the country but it's also good to have the being able to go into town and, ha, and do city stuff as well um, on the weekend or if we're home and we just got around this area and we we're like this is where we need to be and then Kayla actually happened to find this place where we moved and when we came up here it was just like the second I saw it I'm like I've got to do whatever it takes to get this place <laughs> All right, let's get into the fishing then. Uh, you talk about the glide bait stuff. It's been no secret your affinity for that. You're one of the few guys that will actually throw that in competition uh, without hesitation. Um, have you been, did you design one then with Molex? Like, do you have your own here? You're not throwing anyone else's? Is this like Carl's signature series glide bait? Yeah, it's pretty. It pretty much is. You know, I sent Molex sort of everything that I wanted in a in a glide bait. They come back with that their design um, as far as the look of it and everything, which was built around sort of what I had gotten to show them. And then uh, pretty much I went back and forward uh, for about six months on getting it to swim perfect, and that was that was probably where I had the biggest influence on it was getting it to do what it needs to do to get bites. Um, so it took, uh, it took quite some time and they put a, put a lot of energy and effort into it. And the one we have now is, uh, it's, it's the deal. Like it's hard to get a bait that just gets a lot of, a lot of bites. And that's, you know, Brandon's does that. And it was, uh, amazing to have the experience with that and putting it in people's, you know, the biggest thing with a glide bait is majority of them that are made the average fisherman will find it very difficult to catch a bass uh on on a on one of those glide baits because of how much work and technique goes into making it swim perfectly where brandon's and the molex one and there's a couple that are around that i can give it to anyone and say wind that in and chop and change your retrieve a couple times and they've got a as good of a shot at catching a giant as i do you know fishing it it's very yeah. simplified so it just gets a lot of bites and you know that's that's the coolest part about those couple glides all right so when you were in australia were you a dude who threw like big baits and the stuff over there and then you just transferred that style over to america or is this a i'm trying to figure out 
how you end up fishing a glide bait, 99% of the guys don't. Is it something that's like built in your DNA or is it just the fact of your relationship with Freddie and then your friendship with Brandon? You just like happen to, like if you had hung around Zell Rowland instead of Frederick <laughs> Betis, would you be like, look at my signature <laughs> series, <laughs> Papa? You know what I mean? Is, yeah. it, is, it something, I'm saying, is it something that's in you or is it a product of just kind of circumstance of who you ended up hanging around when you came over? It's, a, it's probably a little bit of everything, I'd say. Um, the salmon from Australia, I would say, oh, it's fish bass tournaments in Australia, and a big bass is, you know, four pounds, five pounds. A giant is like seven, eight sort of pounds. Um, but whenever I wasn't fishing bass tournaments or wasn't fun fishing for bass, I was chasing Murray Cod and Barramundi, and they were the, my two, like, favorite species and you know the average size for them are 30 40 50 pounds and bigger you know up to 100 plus pounds using uh similar tackle bait casters um 50 pound braid heavy leader and just and chasing you know giants and so what started to happen was i started to learn the glide bait stuff and watch the guys in california do it and that's what i want that's what i started doing in the off season like instead i just after fishing a full season of tournaments i didn't want to go out and just throw a rattle trap or whatever and catch bass i wanted to go and do something that was totally different and when i figured out the glide bait deal was a way you could specifically only target a giant bass um, that just hit home with me and gave me the feel of what it's like uh, when I'd go home and chase Murray Cod, Barramundi. Like, it, there's a difference between catching fish and fishing, and you might catch a 10 plus or a 12 or a 13 doing anything, um, but you, you're not targeting that specific fish. When you're trying to glide bait, I have a knot in my stomach because I know if that thing stops and I load up, it, that no one knows how big or what it's going to be, what you're going to catch. And that's how it is barramundi and codfish. And when you hook up, you're like, what is this thing going to be? Is it going to be 100 pounds? Is it going to be 30? And it's just a. it gives you a whole – it gives you the tournament feel of catching a bass um, in a tournament scenario uh, just when you're fun fishing because it gets that – it gets that, that adrenaline and that sort of – um, that pursuit of, of something great just gives you that feel. And, uh, and then, yeah, pretty much just growing up, yeah, moving in with Fred, learning tons of stuff off Fred, and then watching Brandon. I always, uh, I, you know, I take note when I was, I was a marshal or was around uh, the Elite Series, I'd always see him with a glide bait on his deck, and I used to wonder, like, I wonder whether it's just there because it's there or whether he actually just uses it. jack with you. <laughs> yeah and then uh and then i started realizing he was using it and then i started to dial it in more for my tournaments and when mm -hmm. and where and how i can actually utilize it and when it all came together was in 2018 and that the single glide bait created the greatest year of my career you know just because of that one bait and then 2019 it hurt me because it went from one end to the other. I started to push it, and then you, you get the opposite effect. So I had um, I had two pretty cool learning years with it, and now I have kind of feel like I've got it dialed to where, like, I know when, where, and why to sort of use it. All right, I think we're going to take a break, but when you come back, I want you, because here's the deal. I'm getting to the point now where I'm getting co-anglers getting in my boat and they'll have a glide bait tied on, but they won't have any idea if it's the right thing or how to throw it or when to throw it. And I got guys that I'm fishing with that are like, I just bought one. What do I do with it? If it's like their first puppy, they're like super yeah. happy to have it and they know how yeah. to pet it, but they don't know how to take care of it. They don't know how to make it grow and be healthy. So when we come back from the break, I want you to take these guys in Oklahoma, in Texas, in Alabama, who have one or two glide baits and don't know what to throw it on or when to throw it. And I want you to simplify this process so they know, Carl said this is where I should be. Even if I'm not getting bit, I know I'm not doing the wrong thing. So that's what I want you to think about during this break so you can help awesome. all these people with these brand new puppies that don't know how to take so care of them. All right, there you have it. We'll take a break. Come back with Carl right here on a Tuesday, everybody. Stay tuned. Let's face it. 
Fishing electronics are no longer an afterthought. They've become a necessity. And at the Bass Tank, our experts match you with the right electronics, provide professional installation, and educate you to help maximize your catching results while providing support along the way. <laughs> because let's be honest, it's about catching, not just fishing. And when you're ready for better results, join the Bass Tank team. Visit us today on Facebook or go to thebasstank.com. Blue Water by TH Marine. Offering LED lighting solutions for your boat, trailer, truck, ATV, and so much more. Engineered and built to be rugged with waterproof and submersible options. Designed for easy installation, Blue Water is available in a variety of colors and styles. All backed by a limited lifetime warranty. Blue Water by TH Marine. The name Spro says it all. Spro stands for Sports Professionals. When you look at the, the pro staff that Spro has brought on board over the past 15 years, it's been pretty incredible. I mean, one got it just then. From the development of the rock crawler to the McStick, from the fat pop of the Little John series, when you tie a Spro bait on, you know it's been designed by a professional to get the job done. While I travel the country on the Bassmaster Elite Series, I simply can't let the weather be the reason I don't win $100,000. That's why I use AFCO clothing to keep me warm, dry, and protected from whatever Mother Nature wants to throw at me. My season depends on it. My career depends on it. AFCO. Any fish, any water. All of us on the Pro Tournament Trail use Gamagatsu hooks. Why? Because they are absolutely the best. It's not about how many bites you get, it's how many you put in the boat. Gamagatsu makes hooks for every fishing style. We didn't come this far to lose fish. Did you? For more information, visit Gamagatsu.com. The Big Bite Baits Kamikaze Swim On is a very unique bait and it's got a full body but with ribs to give it a bigger profile but not more plastic. It's got a jointed tail that gives it a lot of action as well as this up and down crawl type trail with holes and ribs in it so it creates a bubble trail almost. This bait is supposed to be fished upside down or vertical like this on a great for a chatter bait. I prefer it on a swim jig as well. But you can also cut it down and put it on the back of a finesse jig. You know, flip it around for some spotted bass or flipping docks. Anytime you want a small, compact, you know, little trailer for it, this is great for it. So check out the full lineup of swim ons at bigbitebaits.com. All right, we are back on a Tuesday with our special guest. And uh, Matt is live via Skype from Tulsa. Who's our special guest? Carl. Carl. I'm not going to say who? it. Carl who? Carl who? Carl Hey, does that get you mad? Carl Jakobson. Yeah, Carl Jakobson. Jakobson. Not Jakobson. Okay. Hey, I rest my case. He started calling me Matthew like three years ago for some odd reason. It's all right. He calls you Carl Jakobson. <laughs> the J got silent yeah. all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Who was it? Uh, there was somebody else that – oh, Bradley Wah. Not Bradley Roy. Bradley Wah. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Uh, this segment, uh, Matt you set it up. You don't call him Yellis. It's J Yellis, not Yay Yellis. <laughs> okay, point taken. Never mind. All right, Matt, Matt set it up. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of the techniques and stuff. We're going to get to the questions on the instant feedback. And then uh, Carl, a friend of mine, wants to know, 
Uh, some of the applications, obviously, the spawn is taking place. They're getting ready to take place in many areas of the country. Uh, some tips, some techniques for using uh, the this, this swim baits during the, during the spawn and sight fishing. So uh, go ahead. Why yeah. don't you set it up once again, Matt, and let's jump right in on this. Yeah. So, uh, so let's play a hypothetical. I just got my first glide bait. It might be a Stormarashi. It might be, you know, a, a Gancraft, a River to Sea, or your Molex. And I've got this thing, and it looks great. Just give me some confidence, then, as to kind of the basics of it and where I'm going to throw it to have a chance to catch it and when I'm wasting my damn time. Yeah. So, well, now, right now is obviously the best time of the year to catch a true giant, a PB. The fish weigh heavier than they're ever going to weigh all year. Um, the fish are going to be shallow. They're not maybe offshore, maybe up the bank, maybe suspending. They're going to be on the bank once we hit that high 50s to 60s. So you know you're putting that bait in front of those fish. So it's a fantastic time of year to be throwing the glide bait because you're going to get more bites than ever. Uh, and the fish are going to see it. You're going to have fish seeing your bait, and you're going to know whether you're doing the right thing. Um, the biggest thing tip I'd tell people is, like, you know, you don't need to spend a fortune. The Molex, uh, we caught 27 pounds on it the other day in Chickamauga, one of the highest-pressured fisheries in probably the whole U.S. Uh, so to get bites on that, it's a $30, $40 bait. So is the Brandon's. You can buy uh, an amazing bait now for under $50. The expensive ones are great too. I have a collection. I have them all. I love throwing them all. But there's certain ones that you can get that do the right things and they get bit. And it's a great entry level to get into uh, your glide bait. So probably the biggest thing that I try and tell people is if you're going to do it, sort of just go, try and go all in. The biggest mistake I see people do is buy a glide bait. They put it on their flipping rod. They have a eight to one reel on it with braid or with braid with a leader or with some sort of just either too heavy a fluorocarbon or too light. And you just, you're not going to enjoy the experience if you have a bait on the wrong setup. It, the, the whole thing is a bit of a process. And if you put it all together, you're going to enjoy it more and you're going to catch more fish, you're going to get bites, and when you actually do get a bite, you're going to put it in the boat rather than lose it if you have the wrong setup. So quick quick rundown, get the right rod. Uh, you know, most of them will come out with, you know, most of the guys will have a specific swim bait rod. Miller Rods has a Dream Freak. It's eight foot. It has a long uh, butt, like butt handle on it, so you can get it up under your armpit uh, when you're winding that bait. That reels out in front of you, and when you cast, you're going to have leverage. So when you when your hands on the reel and the hands on the end of the rod, you've got leverage to throw that bait with ease and not wear you out. Um, so get the right rod, and then secondly is get the right reel. Low ratio, five point eight to one. 6.2 to 1 at the most and try and get something with a nice big handle. I use the Tranks 300 and Tranks 400 in 5.8, 6.2 and that gives you a slow like winch handle to when you're winding that glide bait back, it's going to be easy, it's going to come back through the water, it's not going to wear you out but most importantly is when you hook that big fish, it's going to act like a winch and you're going to be able to crank on it and not have you're going to be in control of the fish the fish is not going to be in control of the situation you're going to be actually out of handle if you've got an 8.1 smaller reel uh with a small spool on it you, and you hook a 10 pounder you just can't get the leverage on it it's going to jump and it's going to throw the bait i've seen it happen dozens and dozens of times um, i lose very little fish anymore that i get on and then secondly uh, get the right line straight. That's the biggest one that I get asked straight through Sunline shooter 25 pound. That's all you need. That'll catch any fish over 10. That'll catch spotted bass at Lanier and ultra clear water. It will do everything. You can boat flip big fish. Um, it'll kind of do it all. And then when you get your bait and you buy a 30, $40 one, upgrade the hooks, get better hooks on there, get better split rings and then put a snap clip with a swivel on the front. 
and that's going to stop your line from twisting because when you throw a glide bait, it wants to helicopter a little bit, um, just the way they're built. So it'll stop your line twist. The snap clip will actually allow that bait to glide and do what it wants to do. If you don't have the snap clip, it won't get the action that you need it to do to get bit. And then hooks-wise, start at a number two. Uh, it, there's three sizes, two, one, and one o. Oh. The number two I fish right now when it's in the spawn and I want that glide bait to be up shallow and like suspending and sitting in front of those fish. A one when I want to drop it down two, three, four feet max. And then a one o as it starts to warm up and I want to fish it off docks, get it out of my sight and off those sort of bluff walls or ledges. And so that's about... That's about the uh, 101, I reckon, to go and tie one on and uh, cast it and catch some fish. Okay, what about the action on the rod? What did you say? Yep, so the action on, like, the Miller Rod's Dream Freak is eight foot. It's powerful, so it's very heavy down low, but it's still got tip. It's not a broomstick. A lot of people think you got to have a broomstick, but you don't want that because... You want to be able to cast it all day, especially in this time of year. I want to throw the glide all day and not, at the end of the day not be totally worn out. And in the south, like, people don't realise that we, in the south from Texas right across here, we are in prime glide bait area because they haven't seen it as much. People haven't thrown it. In California, like, those guys are so dialed in, have been throwing it for so long. Those fish are just so in tune with what a glide bait is if you went out and tried to learn it in california and you didn't have uh the experience it's going to be a tough ask to catch a glide bait fish in that clear water in the south these fish haven't seen it and so you want to actually use it casting it into tight areas into dock slips i cast them down lay downs get them snagged get them hung up they're only down a little way. You can get in there and you just pop it off. It's no problem. You're not going to lose it. 25 fluorocarbon sunlines, nearly impossible to break. Um, so get it in tight into these areas where you think they're sitting and do small, accurate casts. And then technique-wise, if you do a slow wind, the bait is going to do a big gliding action back and forward. And that's what draws fish in. That They will eat it when it's gliding like that. But a simple slow roll is basically all you need to know and get around fish and probably get them to commit, especially if you've got a little bit of colour in the water and you've got some wind. But the real key is, is, is making it do an erratic dart when that fish is seeing it or when that fish is thinking about committing. And that usually entails just a couple of short, sh sharp quarter turns of the reel. And that's going to get that bait to dart back and forward, turn backwards on itself, and make a erratic panicked action just like a big shad and that's when 90 percent of the fish are going to eat it but for everyone listening in the south that around here that wants to get into it throw it where you would throw any other bait get it in tight around all different types of structure and when you go to a lake and they haven't seen it it's something special you can go and have some incredible days because that bait just hasn't been in their face very much Okay, a couple of people on the Instant Feedback want to know, if they buy their first one, what color would you recommend? Yeah, without a doubt, just buy like a white shad style color. So anything that's thread fin, shad, chrome, white, uh, bone, any, any sort of whitish color. Um, the problem with that, we just had a pretty good discussion about this over the last couple of days, <clears throat> is, is like... Everyone thinks you need crystal clean water, but as soon as it gets too clear, especially in Chickamauga, I just bail on it. I hate it. My confidence goes straight down. As soon as I can see four or five feet down, four feet, I'm like, they're going to follow it. It's not, it's, all the conditions have to be perfect. If it's clear and it's like rainy, cloudy, windy, nasty weather, then, then I know I can get some bites. But if it's calm and it's clear, I'm not going to throw it. They're just not going to eat it, except if you started really playing with your colours and getting your translucent colours that aren't going to show up as much in that clear water. But if you've got a bright white bone colour and you throw it in crystal clean water with no wind, you pro they're probably not going to eat it. But if you've got coloured water, you can only see a foot down, two foot down. There's a perfect sort of colour that I like. It's just that slight stain 
still good visibility, you use that bone or white colour, they're not going to follow it. They're going to eat it. The second they see it, they've got to commit. They're not going to try and follow that action. They're going to see that erratic panic action. It's a big bait. They can hone in on it, and you're going to get those bites. And when I get that coloured water, I get no follows or I get no bites close to the boat. It all happens out there because the, the second the fish sees it, they eat it. Will there ever be a four-day Elite Series tournament won exclusively on a glide bait? Or well, is that a bait where it's going to be always playing a part of a win? Yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to think so. You know, it'd definitely be a it'd be a dream, like it'd be definitely a goal of mine to win one one day, throw on the glide, start to finish. Uh, it is one hundred percent doable. This Chickamauga event that just got postponed that was later, like there's no doubt that that could have went down like very, very easily. Everything lined up immaculately for that to happen. Um, in saying that, like the way I saw it happening, it still probably would have been, you know, throwing a couple certain baits, a trap and a swim bait, you know, and a spinner bait and catching 18 pounds and then going and throwing it and, and you know, having the shot at catching a six to 10 pound fish in the last couple of hours of the day. That's the ultimate tournament scenario for a glide bait. Uh, but like a Gunnersville uh, championship, I got the right conditions and the, everything set up where I just threw the glide bait start to finish and had 21 pounds on day one. And then as you saw, day two, clear, uh, blue bird skies, no wind, no bites. That's just, it's very hard to get those uh, three things locked lined up to get those bites but in the spawn you don't need those conditions as much if all those fish are pushed shallow and the big big ones are up there could have done it four days in a row uh one more kind of bait related question then um and we were just talking who were we talking about this uh we were talking about this i think with andy montgomery like, like uh you're a swim like he's a swim jig dude or another guy is a top water dude because they win so like now everyone's thinking of you as a swim bait dude, but then you look at what you've done at Gunnersville and you look at what you've done at, at, at in Oklahoma on 10 killer. I mean, really you're like a jig dude. So yeah. uh, like, what do you, what do you consider yourself as? And are, is it crazy now that everyone just wants to talk to you about the swim bait or, uh, I mean, you've won like way more money on a jig than you have a swim yeah. bait, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Like the jig, the jig's definitely my uh, go-to confidence bait when I can get on a jig bite. There's something about it that I just have a lot of confidence in. Uh, but <clears throat> I think I think my passion and excitement for glide bait fishing is what comes across to people, and then they they get excited about it too. You know, that's the and and it's just a little bit of an unknown, like majority of fishermen they sort of they know how to fish a jig they know how to do this but the glide bait there's so much to it it seems a little bit uh sort of scary to them and so they want to they want to know the ins and outs and gain some confidence in going and doing it themselves and you know you can catch a fish on any other bait and it's cool and it's fun but when you catch a fish on a glide bait it's like something special you know when someone goes and buys their first glide bait and then they get a fish to eat it at the boat or they see it and you get there's no other bait that gets those kind of follows and you start to see giant fish and you get excited about it there's just you you, you see some of the craziest bites at the boat from nine ten pounders and there's no there's just basically no other bait that's going to do that that's what makes it sort of special but yeah definitely jig wise um and fishing wise and I, I like to be able to do it all but i think just the passion and excitement i have for glide bait fishing sort of comes across to most people all right carl a uh, friend of mine he, he's bored out of his mind in chicago uh you know hunkered down in his basement uh and, and we were talking about swim baits and the spawn and sight fishing what can you tell the people out there about if any app any applications with the swim baits when the fish are on the beds and when they're getting ready to move up or whatever the category is yeah, you just, like, the swim bait's a great way to get, like, the biggest ones to commit to something. It frustrates them. The, the thing with a, any, like, when a, when a bait or a lure does its normal action, it either sinks to the bottom or it continually moves along. It, like a crankbait, 
does its action, fish figure that out and they know like when the thing does that, it's probably a lure and they are wary of it. When a bait is six to 10 inches long and, you know, can weigh eight ounces and it suspends and sits there in front of them, their brain says, that's not a bait. Like that just, and, and then it also swims, you know, several feet to the left and right gliding and regular bait doesn't do that. You can turn it back on itself and get it to turn around. So a big smart fish that has seen thousands of baits, when they see a lure do that, their brain doesn't say that's that could be that could be a bait. It says that's a fish and it's suspending and it's hanging around my bed and that's when you're gonna get like some of the biggest ones to commit to it. Uh, you know, the that they're going to eat it feeding wise. The biggest ones want a big meal, but also it's an aggression thing. So when they're on beds, there's no better way to like find fish, get them to come off the bed and follow it. But if you see one visually and you can't get it to bite, back off it, throw the glide bait over it, and uh, you'll be surprised. That's how most of the guys out west catch a lot of their big fish is when them big ones are on beds and they're aggressive and they throw a huge bait over the top of them. They uh, they can't help themselves. They want to sort of protect it. And when there's something bigger than they think they are there, they're going to attack it. Nice. All right, great info there. All right, Tyler in Tennessee wants to know, you're buying that first swim bait. What would be the best size? What size would you buy to start out with? Yeah, the best size is the sort of the Molex uh, and Arashi size, which is about between six and seven inches. It's like, it's my favorite, like, all-round tournament-style bait. I catch three-pounders on that, no problem at all, and I've caught 10-pounders 10, 10 on them. So uh, that that size is perfect, you know, and <clears throat> the, what you've got to be careful is, and what people do, is they tend to buy a smaller glide bait. And the way I explain... The best way to explain a glide bait is the smaller you go with the glide bait, the more precise and um, the more the fish have to be exactly honed in to that bait. So you go down to a four-inch bait, a five-inch bait, it has to be what they're chasing. It has to look exactly like what they want to eat. It has to look like the prey that they're on and it has to do everything absolutely perfect. The bigger you go in the bait, the less it has to do of anything. Just the sheer size of it is going to create the interest and aggression and follows and attacks. That is what is what actually is doing it. So be careful about trying to buy a small glide bait to learn with to start with because you'll find you won't get many follows, bites, or any interest on it at all. The bigger you go, the actual more success you're going to have with it. And I have a Hinkle trout, and that's how I learned this. It's through my mate Pete that I fish with down in Austin. Is I had every glide bait under the sun, the best looking stuff you could see up to about eight inches, and he just whooped me with a Hinkle trout, which is the size of your forearm. And he would whoop me all the time, and he would have potential PBs. He'd have teen size fish following it up, nipping at it, and I'd be sitting there beside him all day without a bite, and I'm like. I'm getting one of them. And it's huge. When you see it, you're like, there's no way. But that's, that's the bait that I like to throw when um, there's trout or there's just big fish and I'm just targeting those ones. But I've caught five pounders on that bait. But you will see more fish follow that bait than any. It'll create so much interest. And that's when I started to learn. And then I'd get like a four or five inch glide bait that just looked money just look perfectly like a thread fin shad and throw it for days and not get a bite on it like and then that's how i kind of figured out when they're on that shad they're up shallow and you can really dial them in that little glide bait is unreal if you want to get a ton of follows and a shot at a huge one and have a chance at a fish of a lifetime then throw the biggest one you can possibly buy and if you want the perfect size that six seven eight inch size is like ultimate tournament all round sort of fishing bait. What's that Hinkle? What's that Hinkle trout run you there, Carl? Was that like thirty, forty bucks to get your hands on one of those Hinkle trout? Uh, 
I actually got it for a birthday present because I couldn't afford one. <laughs> that tells you how much. So. They're like, what, five, like anywhere yeah, between, five. what, three to 500 bucks? Yeah. Well, Just one, depending one, of on. the ones that, one of the ones that Pete bought was 650 and uh, and I, lo- I lost it. I lost it on him. at. Uh, How'd you lose it? I threw it up into a and it hung over a tree and I was shaking it off and it like it the snap clip went through the split ring and it just oh, dropped off oh, the no. tree. It dropped off the tree and there was current and it landed and it was the middle of winter and we like went in there, I'm freaking out, I'm trying to like thinking about diving in, it's clear. He paid a legit six hundred and fifty dollars for it. And I'm like running lures through there, trying to get it, nothing. And so what did we try and do? We dragged everything through there. We're trying to hook it. Couldn't get it. Anyway, Pete's like, oh, we're wasting time. Let's go fishing. So we fished the rest of the day, and I'm like, I just couldn't even think. I'm like, I can't believe I lost that. So the next that night, I went to Academy, and I bought a cast net, and I cut it up one side so it just, like, opened up. And we went back. And I threw it around there and I dragged it along the bottom. I dragged it along the bottom for like an hour and a half. Pete said, let's go. Don't worry about it. I said, one more cast, threw it out there. And I slowly crept it back all the way to the boat, picked it up. And the Hinkle trout was hanging off the end of the net, put it in the boat. So we no got it way. back. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the only crazy like one that you've lost? I mean, like I know uh, you negotiate some of these crazy baits. Like you, get, I mean, how many of these have you lost? Because I haven't lost one yet. Like, I mean, I've lost, like, a S waiver and stuff, like, off a dock, but, like, I haven't done the that, like, deal where you cast out and you just watch the sucker just keep keep flying while the big yeah. ball like, comes off or broke one yeah, off. Yeah, and that's the, that's the reason you want, like, 25 pound, not yeah. 20 and that, so it'll handle, like, a backlash if you get it and it'll keep the bait on. But that's the only scare that I've had. Like, I tell people they're all freaking out about the bait. I'm like, I've never lost one, like, casting fish nothing you just you don't lose them you just fish that right line have that right snap mm-hmm. and swivel and you know your, your worst chance is like a pike or a muskie eating it and cutting you off that's that's the best chance you've got of losing the bait yeah i mean you just you can't I mean, there's no other way to put it you can't be a dumbass when you're throwing it like you have yeah, to, just, you have to have confidence with it but i mean most of the time it's within three feet of the surface. And like you said, with the heavy stuff, but I mean, if you're a dumbass, you can lose them, but yeah, if you're, you can, yeah, you're hit something hit the rocks with them. Yeah. That happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But, that's a dumbass yeah. move though. <laughs> I mean, there's no reason you should yeah. be hitting the don't, rocks repeatedly don't, with it. Don't land it that close. It doesn't have to be that close. <laughs> hey Carl. But yeah. Very, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to say the the cool part about the glide um, as well is the Molex, the white one that I've been using and catching a lot of the fish on lately is I caught, the first fish I caught on it was about two weeks ago. First one on the, the, the new model, the one ready to go, I caught a four and a half pound smallmouth on it and then, uh, and then we caught 27 pounds on it largemouth and then I went to um, a small spotted bass lake here and caught a bunch of really nice spotted bass on it. So like it's not just largemouth. It's every species of bass, you know. And, How big and then, was that smallmouth? Was it was smallmouth that you caught with the goofy-looking eyes, and yeah, it was like some was, weird color. It looked like a yeah. rockfish mixed with a spotted bass, but it was a smallmouth? It looked like, yeah. It might have been like a mean mouth or some sort of mix. It would, It had like big sores on it and big scars. It was all beat up and old. It was a... And and that's that's the cool thing. It's a big smart fish, and he he fell for fell for that. So uh, it was probably four and a half, close to five pounds. But it's um it's a it's a special bait that it can do that. And when you're around smallmouth fisheries, it's going to target the biggest smallmouth in that fishery. If you're in a spotted bass fishery, it's going to target the biggest spotted bass in there. Like Lanier is the biggest spotted bass I've ever seen. Kayla almost caught it. Um, on a glide bait, and then a couple of casts later, she caught like a four, four and a half, and it looked like a it looked like a pup compared to the one that was trying to eat it right before that. So, it's a very, very cool bait. All right, Carl, man, great, great information. I know the fans greatly appreciate it. This is really, really good stuff. Uh, and I, I've been corrected, Matthew, numerous times on the instant feedback. It's not a swim bait; it's a glide bait. So, hey, that's my <laughs> ignorance. 
All right. I am not an expert. Well, it's I said a before. species of a swim bait, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Doesn't it is it what it is. Fall under the swim bait family. Yeah, it's a, it's a swim bait. It's like different types of bluegill that are all the same thing, but <laughs> they're a bluegill. It's kind of funny. All right, uh, Carl. Yeah. Anything else, man? What are you going to be doing? Uh, it doesn't look like. I mean, it hasn't been announced yet. But I, we would foresee that the Santee Cooper event is going to get rescheduled. You know, what are, what are kind of your plans over the remainder? And then hopefully we kick things off again at the Sabine River. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. It's uh, crazy, crazy times. But we're, uh, we're trying to keep a super positive outlook on everything. And, uh, you know, there's been no time in any of our lives, really, where we've had a situation like this. So you can only take each day as it goes. And... We're, uh, we're, we're, we're not backing off at all. We're going full throttle with social media, talking to all of our sponsors, what can we do, working with Bassmaster, interviews, you guys, I'm editing. I'm just, we're just going harder than I ever have before as far as content and working for the sponsors because now's the time to step up and, and, uh, and help everyone as best you can. This is not a time to sort of sit around. Although... Um, at the same time, we are in just absolutely loving, you know, we're so lucky that we got this place because otherwise we may have been, uh, I don't know, sitting in Jean's shop and things could have been a bit different. But this, uh, this, this place has definitely helped us keep a positive outlook on things. We're still fishing. We want to promote fishing and people to get out there because you can still do it safely no matter what. Um, we... Uh, getting out on the lake, fishing down here, heading to the rivers and having zero contact with any other human or putting anyone at risk at all. Um, we're just we're preparing our food here, getting our waters. The only thing that we might do is have to put fuel in the boat and that's just getting out of the truck, using a glove, washing your hands, fueling up and then hitting the lake. So um, there's never been a better time to get out and get on the water. And, and it's been pretty cool to me. I've been seeing... Uh, you know, the boyfriend, girlfriend sitting on a dock. They don't really know what they're doing, but they've got one fishing <laughs> rod and they're out on the end of it, you know, having a go. And it's kind of forced people to be like, man, this is, I need, we're going to get outside. And there's more people doing it. And there's a lot of sad and bad things that are happening with this, but there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of good and a lot of positives come from it. And a lot of people are going to learn a lot from this. And I think we're going to all come out of it uh, better off uh on the other side but yeah we're just we're staying positive my tackle and my shop and everything has never been more organized in my life so um, i'm uh, happy about that and you know just taking little things that we used to for granted we've got a basketball hoop all playing basketball play ping pong have fun with your with your mates and people and do things that normally you're just like go 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 at this time of year and it's you just don't stop and instead you sort of it's been crazy to sit down and be like Usually, if, if other people are working and going hard, then it's very hard for me to settle down. I'm going to go, but when everyone, we're all in this together, we're all in the same situation, got to uh, everyone just got to kind of work together and try and be positive through it. I think we'll be fine. How much is gas there? I'm just curious. A gallon? Yeah, I still I filled up the other day at a dollar eighty nine diesel. Wow. So diesel. I, 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 yeah, a week and a half ago, uh, two weeks ago, I filled up our new truck. Uh, and it cost like $128 or something. And then I filled it up the other day, same amount, and it was just on $80. How about like regular two fuel? Later. How about regular? Regu- I think regular is $199, I think it is. I think it's, I think it's hmm. about that. Maybe it's, maybe it's a bit less. Yeah. I, I filled my boat up has, a little uh, while ago. Has Douglas taught you how to throw a Ned rig yet? <laughs> yeah, he's been on me about the Ned, and we've been... Uh, you know, that's, that's been cool too, like getting to fish with Brandon and uh, my mate here, Andy, that uh, lives in um, lives around here. And then Josh, me and Josh got to go out and I got to show him a bunch of glide bait stuff. He's shown me tons of his smallmouth new techniques and just fishing with uh, a few different guys. But we've got to be smart about it right now too. You know, now I'm not fishing with, only fishing with people that are here that I know where they've been and sort of trying to, trying to promote that fishing smart you know that's bass smart has got the live smart fish smart thing and i think that's a that's a great way to look at it we can still go fishing uh but we just got to be smart about it all right man great stuff matthew anything else you good i'm good all right carl man be safe 
Uh, very, very cool stuff today on the show, and we uh, and the fans greatly appreciate it. Do you want to uh, do you want to have a quick look at the shop, and I'll show you a couple uh, oh, yeah. wide baits real quick. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Hopefully, we'll we'll still have good service in there. Yeah. Oh, the shop's just literally right there. Yeah. So that was that's like the living room where we were, kitchen, bathroom, and now I was sitting there, and then you walk out, and that's Josh's boat in here and this is kind of the work that we've been doing making this into a bit of living and we filled this area in and made a loft so our bedroom is actually upstairs now and then boats there ready to roll workout area starting to get a little home gym set up got all the mustang gear and then here's the lure wall starting to come along pretty good this is where i do all the little all my all my tinkering, the trophy, motivation. And, uh, <laughs> that's the uh, that's the Molex glide right there. Can you see that? Pretty good. It might show yeah, a little bit further right, down. Right, yeah, right there. Look, there, oh, right there. Right there. Yep. That's the Molex. That's the Molex glide. Um, just been playing with different hooks from owner, different split rings, and then uh, you know the biggest question that I get asked a lot is snap clips and swivel and i've always had to like build a snap clip and then put a swivel on it but owner have the snagless snap and it is ready to go with a swivel on it and uh, i use the number six so number six owner snagless snap is all you need and uh you'll be tie that on and you'll be ready to go and then here's a little glide bait look you got brandon's arashi gang crafts high powered herrings Gancraft, phony frogs, the big bullgill, phony frog, and the shad. There's, there's your, there's your Roman mates. Yeah. How, how much, how much for them, mate? <laughs> Depth 250 triple trouts from original in California when I first moved out there. That's where it kind of started. Oh, actually, got to go and buy there. And then here's the mega bass ice slide, and then the big dog. That's the yeah, put that on your hand to show people. Hey, hold that up against your uh, against your Molex bait, just for comparison. Yeah, <laughs> just like run. put it up against. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that thing is like, what is it like, twelve ounces? Yeah, I think it's twelve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it legitimately. For those who haven't seen it, I mean, you can tell how big it is. It in person, yeah. it legitimately is like the size of a rainbow trout that you get in a restaurant. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, full size. That is the exact size of a rainbow. Like if you order the rainbow trout from like Uncle Fred's Frog Legs and Fish, <laughs> like that's what the trout's gonna look like. That's the size that you're dealing with right there. Yeah. So that's you know that's pretty much you know, and there's bigger ones than that. There's the Roman made mothers. You know, the ice slides are pretty big too, and Oliver Nye has a ton of success with that. This is the colour from Molex. That's the packaging, Glide Bait 178. That's their bluegill colour, and uh, just starting to roll with that now. But, uh, yeah, that's the, that's a bit of a look at the shop. This is pretty much my, my heaven and uh, where we get all the work done, and uh, thankful that we have it. That's very cool. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. Yeah. That's like a decade in the making, over a decade. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, 10 years in the U.S. and uh, pretty much a lifetime getting after it. But uh, I, I, uh, I mean, I remember he would st Carl would stay like in the hotel room at Grand and he had a single mattress and he would just come and just toss the single mattress on the floor and sleep and yep. was like staying at Fred's. And Julie would be like, dude, you got to be in by like 10. Like I got little kids, like just kind of like <laughs> come a bit a little bit early. Digitally. Yeah. No, nah, I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people have helped me uh, over my career and you've got to have that, you know, anyone can say that they've done it themselves, but you've, you have to have the motivation and energy and effort and you have to put, it's all up to you, but uh, you have to have a lot of good people that that help you along the way, and I've been lucky to have that. I got I got one more question, and you got to be honest with me on this. Is it nice yeah. 
to to finally be to the point where you're doing interviews where it's not everyone asking you about Australia and you're actually able able to just talk about fishing and catching fish and tactics and fishing on the elite series yeah no that's pretty cool i i really like that and that shows that i've you know i think i've gotten over the other side of it just being like feeling a bit like a gimmick like i'm just from australia having a crack you know i'm like <laughs> people are starting to take it, take it serious like oh you can actually catch them too <laughs> that's uh that's a good that's a good feeling but at the other side um, I love talking about Australia and I love telling stories and hearing stories from the US and showing people how different we are and the thing, different things we do. We're going to cook, we're going to try and cook damper today, um, you know, which is an Aussie type bread that we cook on the fires when we're fishing. And, you know, we just, little things like that come up all the time and people in the US, they are interested in Australia and love talking different stories of how we all uh, live and just doing little things like that is uh, is pretty cool. What's hey. the, the moose rack behind you? That looks old school. That looks like an old moose rack. Yeah, that guy left. The guy left it here. He left some of the stuff. Oh, there's no cool story. Take, it's, it's just I some other guy's old went, rack. I should have said like I knew that this was coming, so I killed one with my bare hands and stock the freezer <laughs> but it's not it's not it's not that cool of a story hey one last big question hey, I, I, hey oh, I, I mean i, I want to ask matt real quick i want to learn how to catch crappie i've been jealous <laughs> seeing those crappie because i want to actually eat some uh, i've been yeah it, there's give, give me a shout afterwards and what's the can, secret uh, I'll, there, there's a there's I'll a couple of secrets it's dude so like there's like you know there's like the old like the the old, I'm sure you've heard the stories of like the swim bait underground guru guys like out in California that were all like part yeah, of like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone kind of got familiar with it with all the, when the Mike Long crap went down. Well, there's like this group of obsessed crappie guys doing like crazy stuff and it's like the same thing. And I like somehow weasel my way on the fringes. Like I'm not like yeah. in the middle yet, like of it stuff, but I'm kind of yeah. like on the on the fringes enough to where I'm getting some crumbs where I'm making it, where I'm kind of making it work. It's nice. crazy. Like, so they're obsessed with their best seven. So you got it. Like I have the digitals and it's like what your best seven way instead of the uh -huh. best five. And uh -huh. then like three pounds is the Holy grail. Two pounds is like when you take a novice out and they catch a two pounder, you like make them feel really good about the two pounder. Like I yeah. did. I was like, Oh yeah, I'm a two pound. And then you realize like, you know, so it's equivalent of like, you know, they're catching like the seven to 14 pound bass and everyone else is going, how the heck is this happening? But it's in the crappie world. And it's like, it's kind of crazy how they're, how these guys are yeah. doing it. There's a couple different techniques, but, but it's, there's, oh. it's not just like go out with the cork and like, oh, look, here's a school of three pounders. Like yeah. you're hunting this, you're hunting them. I it's know, like glide baiting like, for crappie. Yeah. That's what I want to do because I catch them all the time, but just like I'll catch one. There'll be a big one on a bass bait. Yeah. And then I'm like, I want to catch another one, and then you can't do it. But, uh, you know, just it, especially around here, just get, that's probably the prime, like, food source. And we've got crappy here. And yesterday um, I caught, like, some real big, uh, what are they, like, shell crackers? They're, like, proper red ears, big ones. Yep. Yeah, like red ears. And I started getting right into it. I was like, it's fun. I was finding them on the side imaging and catching them, and, and they taste unreal. So never a better time to catch a, a feed. Hell yeah. All right, Carl. Do one the, the, one, okay. one yeah, last one. Last, keep, one. No, keep going, Carl. Carl, ask as many questions as you want. <laughs> I'm asking back. Do the crappy guys that are pros, are they, uh, are they keeping them to eat, or is it like a bit of a catch and release thing? No crappie ever um, gets released, does it? No, under, so like under a pound and a half, catch and release into the grease. Every, like a lot of the, the smaller ones. But those bigger, bigger kind of breeding crappie, I mean, it, it takes a long time for a crappie to get over, you know, two, two and a half pounds. Around Oklahoma, okay. like now listen, if you're listening to this in Mississippi or you're down on Lake Fork, like, like yeah, tune out. I'm talking about like normal everyday people catching crappie. I mean, that's like yeah those have monster crappies but anything over two uh typically just release especially because okay. those fish are going to be their biggest in the winter going into the spawn so they're all they all have eggs in them so you just keep the genetics plus the way you're catching them the way everyone's catching them no one's really sure how many exist in the lake 
So like yeah. are there thousands yeah. of these two pound crappie or like yeah. is the way that everyone's catching them like are there a couple hundred or you know three or four hundred and it's just we figured out yeah. they have figured out how to target the biggest one so it's still kind of a a novel deal there but yeah giant yeah. ones over like, like okay uh, inches wise like over 15 inches chuck it back under keep because they all the crappie people go in pounds they don't do inches inches is like you know what the yeah. rookies do because at first you know i was like well how many inches is that and they're like i don't know it was a 246 you're like well i don't know what that means it's like i mean to me it's like kilograms awesome. and pounds you know what i mean yeah, yeah, that's cool. Oh, that's so, good to know. So. That's awesome. No, he's yeah, gonna. Like, hey, hey, Carl, he's gonna start his new adventure. It's gonna be Crappie Talk Live. That's what he's gonna do. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see it happening. He's he's, he's he into it. it. He's into it. All right, one last. <laughs> he, he, one last question yeah. from the instant feedback. Dave has asked. 12,000 times. He wants to know, does the new glide bait have rotating trebles on it? It does. And that, that is a, that's a must um, just for being out of land fish. Uh, with a glide bait, you know, you kind of got uh, all the, the hardest things to try and um, actually land them. And so having a rotating swivel, uh, I can show it there. So that. That little cuff there, that's a, actually an inbuilt swivel into the end of it. And so what that's going to do is pretty much stop the fish from getting leverage on it when it jumps and, and able to throw the hook. So that's, uh, that's a must, having, having the swivel um, connected to your treble. All right. There you have it, folks. Uh, just a great, great show. And uh, it, it, sometimes it gets a little difficult when we're doing the three-location thing. We kind of override each other, so apologize for that. But, Carl, just great, great stuff and wish you nothing but the best. Hopefully we can get back to action soon. Yep, we'll be back and appreciate having me on. And uh, everyone stay safe and get out there and catch a few fish. All right. See you guys. Very nice. All right, take care. All right, that's going to uh, wrap it up. Matt, you hold tight once Carl leaves, and uh, we'll bring you back in here just in a few minutes and i think i have you right now let's see here all right you there hi <laughs> hello i don't have the hang on let me pull it up real quick here hello uh all right there we go all right a, a funny thing real quick and and yes, i sir. i, I want to apologize to the people that will be listening to this on iTunes. This is no joke, man. During the entire show, I don't know where it was coming from. It sounded like there were uh, there was a horse galloping in the background. And it would randomly what? show up. Yeah. A horse. Like a... Like it wasn't static. It was like a noise. It, it sounded like a horse. I am not kidding you. Well, it wasn't me because I got no horses around me right now. I don't. It, I I have no idea, dude. When it, listen, uh, listen to it. the replay. It? Is it bad? No, it's just random. It sounds like a Is it horse. Worse than the Aaron Martin's cat. No, well, it was kind of bad. It was kind of I, I, just kind of funny. Aaron Martin's cat's meowing in the background. Bad. Yeah. Just a a, a horse galloping every now and then. During the entire show. For how long? The entire show. I swear, I thought you had something going on on your laptop that had some audio of a horse galloping. No, I wasn't doing anything. Anyway, so it is what it is. It's not bad. It's kind of what, funny, though. You think I just watch horses gallop on my I, laptop? I have no idea. On, on repeat? I, dude, I don't know. All right, Big Polly in New York saying... It wasn't on the YouTube feed. So maybe it was just me. Seriously. Horses <laughs> galloping in the background. I don't even know how to respond to that. I, I well. That was good stuff, though. It seems like oh, it was, was great. in a really good spot when he needed to be in a good spot and yeah. good for him. And it's nice to see someone who wins at the right time when they need the win and then take full advantage of it and, uh, I'm really excited to see where his career goes from here. 
Oh, how badass was that shop? It was badass. But what you also have to understand is he's had that shop in his head for the last 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, he's really busted his I mean, he's put tail. in the time. Yeah. He has earned that freaking shop, Mark. I mean, he has earned it. It ain't like he, like, took out a loan, decided he was going to build a badass shop, and now he's going to go try and fish. Like, he has busted his ass to have that shop. And anybody who knows him or has worked around him yeah. or knows what he's about knows that he's earned that thing. Yeah. He's put in the time, the, the blood and sweat equity for every square foot of that. 100%, man. Good dude. Really, really good dude. And uh, definitely somebody that is on the upswing. And you're right, man. Sweat equity. Not a whole lot out of that out there too much anymore and uh he's definitely the poster child for that because he has busted his tail all right man uh tomorrow hopefully i will know here in a few if we're gonna have chris aldane in studio if not he will be live via skype from fort worth but the plan right now is to have him on live via skype or uh live in studio and then we'll use skype as a backup kevin van dam on thursday yeah can't wait for that one Swindle. Yeah. On Friday. Yep. And then Littner on Monday, the Rojas super on Tuesday. Star studded week. Yeah. Superstar week. Yeah. Superstars next week. Yeah. All right. That's it. Everybody be safe. Uh, Matt, we will talk very soon and uh, get ready. Good week so far. Three more shows to come this week. Everybody out there be safe. That's it. We're out of here. <laughs>